Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and welcome back to Ex Situ, Operation Wallacea's online lecture series. This week we're heading out to the cloud forests of Honduras, specifically Kasuko National Park, where we've been running our project since 2003. George Lonsdale is joining us to tell us all about snake conservation in this rare and beautiful habitat. So I'll hand over to George, enjoy the lecture and come back and watch the rest of our series. My name is George Lonsdale, I am a wildlife biologist and herpetologist. Um, and for the next half hour or so, you've got me to talk about snake conservation in a cloud forest. Um, before I start, I just wanted to give um, a bit of an introduction to myself. So for the past seven years or so, I've been working in some form or another um, as uh, in tropical field ecology. And it all started uh, when I started doing my BSc um, in international wildlife biology. And from that quite broad subject, I then went on to focus on herpetology and on snake ecology. And um, I'm now the lead herpetologist for the um, Kasuka National Park site for Operation Wallacea in Honduras. Um, and when I'm not there doing my field research, I uh, spend a lot of time in the UK um, doing science communication talks uh, and presenting both about my research and um, wildlife biology, uh, zoology, that kind of thing um, in general and other, uh, other parts of my hobbies. But a lot of that science communication that I do tends to be through social media um, things through Instagram, for example. Um, and my expeditions have been um, broadly focused around the tropics. Um, or, or areas very close to them. So for example, in Southern Africa and Northern Africa, um, in the Caribbean, in Southeast Asia, specifically Borneo, um, in Honduras, which is something I'm going to talk a little bit about in a moment, and also in Thailand, where I spent some time working with venomous snakes there too. Um, but it's not just been about snakes and about herpetofauna. Um, I've also been studying uh, a variety of taxas like birds, insect mammals, bats, plants, freshwater, uh, macro inverts, tropical reefs, amphibians, reptiles, and obviously, as well, and snakes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Central America, but um, before I do, it's quite important to understand why Central America is so biodiverse. Um, and that's because um, before Central America existed, we had these two large continents, North America and South America, and there was no land bridge between them. So all of the evolution that was happening on them was happening separately. Um, and that was until the, these two plates, the Cocos plate and the Caribbean plate, uh, moved in, collided and caused um, what's called the Isthmus of Panama, which is what we now know as Central America. Uh, it's very volcanically active and it's very, very mountainous. Um, Importantly, what happened when this land bridge formed is that all of the biota from North and South America now had a bridge to be able to swap places. It's called the Great American Biotic Interchange. Now, not all of them went all the way. Lots of them stayed in this kind of mixing pot in Central America, and many of them actually got trapped on the tops of these mountains, um, which is why we have such high end um, endemism on these mountains. It's also why there is such high biodiversity. Um, and Central America, so that we all know where uh, we're actually talking about, is uh, this area here. So it's the very, very skinny bit just south of Mexico. So you've got the US, Mexico, Central America then comes down here, and then you've got uh, South America down at the bottom. Uh, and this is a little bit closer up, and we are specifically looking smack bang in the middle of that in Honduras. And where that star is, is where my field site is. That's Kasuka National Park in Honduras, um, and it's just... Uh, in the mountains above San Pedro Sula, which is the second largest city in the entire country. Now, this is a crude map of Kasuko, but it does actually explain quite a few key features about it. So within that green line to start with is what's called the Kasuko core zone. Uh, and inside there, um, the protection levels are very, very high. There's very limited amounts of anthropogenic influence that can happen in here. You're not allowed to deforest in here. You're not allowed to farm anything in here. And you're not allowed to live in here either. Outside of that green line, the, uh, the rules are relaxed a little bit. There is a certain amount of those um, practices that you can partake in. And there is a certain amount of people that can live in there as well. Um, and what you can see is these red dots that are spread out across the um, across the entire map. Those are our research camps that we have um, that radiate out from each of them. Um, and I'll show you those a little bit later. Um, our camps are spread out through Kasuko based on their elevation. Um, Kasuko, um, by nature of being a cloud forest, is very mountainous, um, which allows us to study uh, um, taxes at different elevations um, and our lowest camp is Santa Tomas which is at about 550 meters above sea level and it goes all the way up to our highest camp which is Cantiles which is um, uh, just over 1800 meters above sea level 
Um, and what's also quite important to, to note about Kasuko is, is this. This red line that splits down the middle uh, broadly separates the west side and the east side of the park. And that also broadly follows um, a departmental border, which means that there are separate governments that are in charge of each side of Kasuko. And because of that, there are different management strategies that these governments have put in place. And that can be seen when you look at the um, the level of deforestation, for example, um, compared from the east side to the west side. Um, and this is also um, quite a descriptive map for Kasuko as well, um, because this shows quite clearly how mountainous it actually is. Um, so when you go down towards Santa Tomas and further um, to the west, you can see that um, it drops off to almost sea level, um, to around 11 metres above sea level. Um, and the closer into the centre of the park you get, the, the more mountainous it becomes, the higher the ground is, um, up to about 2,400 metres at the very, very highest points um, of Kasuko around um, Cantiles. And um, because of that really, really wide variation in elevation, it causes a lot of different habitats um, to have formed. Um, in the lowlands, we have lots of lowland rainforest, which um, is very wet, very hot and very humid. Above that, in terms of um, elevation, so as we come up the mountain a little bit, we also have cloud forest. The cloud forest kind of does look a little bit like um, the lowland rainforest, but it tends to be a lot cooler. And it also doesn't rain anywhere near as much. Um, instead, the majority of the precipitation that we get in cloud forest actually tends to be um, part of the clouds itself rather than rain. And then on top of that, further up the mountains, right at the top, we also have what's called elven forest or dwarf forest. And that's because the very, very harsh conditions on the top of these mountains has caused a stunted growth of a lot of these trees, which means the canopy is a lot lower down. And it also means that the, uh, the, the mosses and the epiphytes have kind of taken over. Um, and as you can see, there's bromeliads all around you. Um, and this, the plants here tend to have very, very wacky cuticles. It's quite dry because the conditions really are quite harsh up here. Um, a really important question to ask is, is why is Kasuko protected? Uh, because importantly, it isn't actually protected because of the um, because of how diverse it is. It is actually protected because of its water, because of its situation um, in the mountains above San Pedro Sula. All of the rain that falls on Kasuko goes into its rivers, and then those rivers directly feed the city. Um, majority, in fact, of um, Pedro's water comes from Kasuko uh, and the wider catchment area. And the Honduran government decided that what they wanted to do was uh, protect all of the land in Honduras that was above 1800 meters because it's so crucial for those water sources for each of their cities. What was then found is that if they put this buffer zone around it, they could further protect the water. And then biologists went in and found that it was hyper diverse as well. Um, but despite all of these protections, there still are some major threats to Kasuko as well. Uh, the first, in deforestation. Um, as this photo quite, clear, clear, quite, quite clearly shows, um, which is actually just outside one of our camps, um, there are huge swathes of areas that have been cut down completely. Um, they use a method called slash and burn, where they tend to cut down um, large areas of forest and then burn it so that the area becomes cleared and then they can... Um, uh, kind of take the area over for the next threat, which is agriculture. And this can come in a few different forms. Um, the most common that we see are um, cardamom plantations, like this one photographed, coffee plantations, and slightly lower down the mountain, although it is uh, encroaching up, is cattle ranching as well. And then another major threat um, to Kasuko as a whole, but um, more specifically to the amphibians, is disease. Kasuko has um, what we know is. Um, uh, a, a fungal pandemic um, called amphibian chytrid fungus, which is a, a fungal pathogen that infects amphibians of, of all shapes and sizes um, and has led to the extinction of many species in uh, Central America. And in Kasuko, what we think is that a lot of the species that are susceptible to it have gone through about an 80% population decline, which has obviously decimated their populations, um, but also has implications for species that were treated on amphibians because Potentially, there might be less food around for them um, to, to have access to. Um, but despite these threats, Kasuko is still incredibly diverse. Um, so I realise I've been talking for a while. So um, here's some nice photos of some of the wildlife in Kasuko. Um, we've got some incredible snakes, which are obviously my favourites. Um, some snakes are like the giant parrot snake, like Topazahetula. 
We also have lots of venomous snakes like the Mexican jumping pit viper. There are also um, some incredible coral snake mimics like the red-backed coffee snake, which doesn't live in the cloud forest very commonly, but it does tend to uh, live a little bit further down the mountain. Um, and it actually quite um, thrives in um, coffee plantations. And mimicking these snakes, the coral snakes, which are highly toxic, very, very venomous snakes related to cobras and mambas. Uh, this is the variable coral snake, Macrurus diastema. And then there are some more convincing coral snake mimics as well. Um, this one uh, is, is very, very convincing mimics, the twin false coral snake, Pleosursus helipoides. And we also have some incredible um, endemic snakes too. Um, this is a species called Redonella pegasolita, and it only occurs in Kazuka National Park and nowhere else in the world, which means if its habitat disappears, it's likely that the snake will disappear too. There are also some incredible other animals out there too. Uh, for example, we have uh, an extremely wide diversity of invertebrate. Um, yeah, this isn't actually a snake, this is a caterpillar um, called Hemeroplamnes plamus. Um, it's a hawk moth caterpillar that has evolved to look like venomous snake. And uh, normally it just looks like a bit of broken wood. And if you knock the branch that it's on, it swings this snake's head round to scare off any uh, potential predators. And then there are also these incredible amphibians as well. Um, so this is a critically endangered endemic uh, spike thumb frog called Petrohyla exquisita. Um, it's one of the species that we are studying for um, looking at the prevalence of chytrid fungus and how it might affect the populations of these frogs. It's because it's critically endangered, it's only found in Kasuko, and if, if chytrid fungus is having a detrimental effect on them, then it is likely going to wipe out this species. And, and we are also studying um, chytrid fungus in this species too, uh, which is endemic to the, the wider region, not just Kasuko. Uh, this is the mossy red-eyed tree frog, Gulmana hylus seralia. Uh, the spike thumb frog is much, much bigger than this one. It's about the size of your fist, whereas this one is about the size of the end of your thumb, only about 25 millimeters or so. And as well as frogs, we also have some incredible salamanders. This is um, another endemic species, another critically endangered endemic species called Edipina tomasi, the Kasuko worm salamander. Uh, again, never been found anywhere else in the world. Um, it's only known from Kasuko, and if it's... Um, if chytrid affects these species, which we think it might, it is likely that they are going to be going extinct. And most importantly, at least from uh, from my perspective, is um, the arboreal pit viper that we have in Kasuko, Phryechis marchi. Um, and that is what I'm going to be talking a little bit further about as we go through. So my current research um, is all based around my um, master's project that is looking at the natural history of herpetofauna in Kasuka National Park. Um, and we're also looking at snake spatial ecology. And it's basically split into two separate chapters, the first of which is all about community ecology. And um, now before I go specific into specifics about my project, just a little bit of a lesson on snake community ecology or, or cloud forest ecology. Um, uh, is things that we know. So we know that as elevation increases, so as we go up the mountain, the temperature and the species richness decrease. So it gets colder and we find less species there. We also know that as elevation increases, the amount of endemic species and the amount that these species are uh, specialized to altitude increases, which leads us to have these very distinctive thermal and spatial niches that are spread out across the mountains, which is um, it's really easy to, to demarcate. But as we introduce things like climate change and other anthropogenic impacts, what we can see and what has been shown in Kasuko is that we have a squeezing of these niches. So uh, species that uh, normally would live at the top of the mountains are being squeezed up by the ones that would normally live at the bottom, and they are given a bigger range, while the ones at the top are being given a much smaller range. The way that we have been surveying um, for our community ecology um, research is initially looking at what we call sweep transects. And sweep transects are uh, utilizing the network of transects that radiate out from each one of our camps that looks like this. So each camp has uh, several footpaths that go uh, uh, outwards from it that range from about 600 meters all the way to about three kilometers. And they get walked daily to um, record every species of snake that we come across along those transects. We also look at river transects, which are a shorter um, section 
of Transec that um, is along a river close to one of our camps. And this gets walked every single night. And the idea of these is that we can detect species that are uh, both nocturnal and more associated with streams than they would be the regular paths. Um, so it's so that we can detect as many species as possible. The last uh, survey method is what we've called opportunistic surveying, which basically is a catch-all um, way of saying that any time a snake was found when we weren't on one of our standardized transects like the, uh, the pathways or the rivers, uh, we would still record all of the data that we would normally would. For example, if you were sat eating your dinner and a snake fell out of the tree, you could still use that data. Um, and then the interesting bit, uh, what have we found? Well, um, what's quite clear to see straight off the bat is that we find some species more than we find others. So um, I realise the species list is actually quite hard to read, but on the uh, left side of your screen, uh, you can see that we have detected Seraphidium wilsoni more than any other snake. Um, when this data was collated, we had 512 detections, um, and down at the other end, we've had some snakes that have only been detected once or twice. And we can also see how successful our methods have actually been at finding these snakes. So this goes up to um, 2017, so there is some a little bit more data to add on to this. But what you're looking at is what's called a species accumulation curve. So when we first started doing standardized um, methods in 2007, we've added species to our species list um, consistently, um, but the rate that that happens will slow down as you get better at detecting them. Um, and eventually you will know exactly how many species are in Kazuko, and that curve will reach what's called asymptote, which is starting to show that it might be getting close to it, but it isn't there yet. So there might be some species still there to record. Um, and if we separate that out, what you can see is that our transect data line, which is the blue line, um, has actually flattened out, which means all of the species that we are likely to find on our transects have been found. But the opportunistic data, so um, our data from uh, just being in the forest, um, is still increasing. And every couple of years, we do add another species to the list from our opportunistic data. And that's why our combined curve hasn't quite dropped off yet. Um, we're still raising up a little bit. So it's likely that there are still some species to add. Now, I'm not just interested in um, the how many individual species, the species richness in each one of our sites. What I'm more interested in is um, looking at what role these species perform for the snake community. What is their functional um, role in the community? And what I've done is I've taken every species of snake in Kasuko and um, I've into one of four groups. The first group is the vipers, which are snakes that have ecology like vipers. For example, they um, tend to be uh, cryptically coloured, they tend to not move very much and they tend to have um, an ecology that's based around ambush predation. Uh, so the second group is the fossorial snakes, which are, tend to be small snakes that um, live either underground or in the leaf litter. They're feeding on things like um, invertebrates primarily, but there are some snakes that um, are feeding on bigger things like lizards and so some like coral snakes that um, primarily feed on other snakes. The next group is the large cursorial snakes, which are bodied um, active hunters, they tend to be diurnal, they tend to be fast moving, uh, things like racers or indigo snakes would fit into this category. And then our last one is uh, a group that doesn't really fit into any of the others called the nocturnal arboreal specialists. Um, these are snakes like our um, bun-headed tree snakes, for example. They're very, very long, thin snakes. They're highly arboreal, very, very well adapted to nocturnal living. And they also have very high specialization in the jaw and teeth morphology allow them to hunt um, soft-bodied prey, things like snails and slugs or lizards or uh, things like frog eggs as well. And what you can see is that each camp has uh, its own signature functional community breakdown. But what I'm interested in is not just what the breakdown is, but also how has that changed over time. Now, when I first started working in Kasuko, which is in 2015, what we noticed was that there is an acceleration in how much deforestation was occurring in the core zone. Um, and because of that, um, what we are interested in is what was the community like before that acceleration was noted and then what is the community like after that acceleration was noted. So I've taken two separate data sets here, one from pre and one from post, um, so that we can compare them. And uh, what you can see is that in every single camp there is a difference, um, but the one, that, the one camp with the biggest difference is El Cortecito. And this is why El Cotito is the worst affected camp by deforestation by a long way. And um, this photograph is taken from um, one of the transects, transect one, and it looks down into the valley and the camp is actually situated down in the bottom of that valley. Um, now, 
to really understand what's going on in Codecito, um, I wanted to separate the transits out a little bit, um, and that's uh, this is what that looks like essentially. So, um, Codecito transect one um, has had a huge drop in species richness from uh, seven species found there to only one species found there. Codecito transect two has had another drop, but not quite as significant. Codecito transect three has had an increase in the species richness. There's more species found there than there was um, in that pre-acceleration um, of deforestation period. And the river transect as well has also had an increase in how many species are found there. And what's interesting about this very, very raw data is that two transects that have decreases in their species richness are also the two transects that have experienced um, deforestation with the more severe transect one having um, experienced the worst deforestation and transect two, which is a little bit higher up the mountain and goes in the opposite direction um, of this mountain ridge. Um, that has experienced less, but as we uh, have noticed now that the deforestation is encroaching further and further up that transect, it's likely to increase. Now that was species richness, but like I said, that might not necessarily be the best um, descriptor. So. What does that all mean for the functional community structure? Well, transect one, which is uh, quite clearly the worst affected transect, has been homogenization. Um, and now the only species that has been found during those time periods um, after the acceleration in deforestation is now the nocturnal arboreal specialists. The vipers are no longer being found, the large cursorial stakes are no longer being found, and the cursorial stakes are no longer being found. And the reason for it is, well, if there are no trees, then it's less likely to find um, snakes that live in leaf litter because there's less leaf litter. But it also means it's likely to be less prey around, so the large fossorial ones are, are, are being put out as well. Now, there is still a lot of questions to ask um, around this. There's a lot more community analysis that I need to do. Um, there is also uh, a lot more questions that I want to answer um, about how does the community vary over the elevation, not just looking at these camps as proxies for that. Um, I want to also look at how it's changed over time in terms of the elevation and see if I can tease apart whether these um, changes are due to land use change, whether they're due to climate change, or whether they might just be due to natural variation. Now, the second chapter is one that I'm really excited about. It's um, all about radio telemetry. Um, and what I've been doing in Kasuko is I've been radio tracking three different species. The first species is the Mexican jumping pit viper. Second species is the Honduran montane pit viper. And the third species, which is the kind of core species of my project, is the Honduran emerald palm pit viper, which uh, is only found in northwestern Honduras. And uh, Kasuko, we think, is the largest um, kind of stronghold for this species. Now, we don't actually know very much about this species, and that's why I'm so interested to find out more using radio telemetry. Uh, but what we think we know is that we think it's highly arboreal, and we think it's an amphibian specialist. What I did was I used this radio telemetry equipment to find out as much as I could about these three species. I used um, this radio, and I used radio transmitters, this radio receiver, and an aerial to follow the snakes every single day for two months. The transmitters were tiny little transmitters. They weighed about two grams. And I used a combination of duct tape and superglue um, to attach them to the snakes. Um, and this works actually quite perfectly because, because of the nature of my study only being um, uh, two months long, it meant that when the, uh, the snakes would next shed their skin, the transmitters would come straight off. Uh, and you can actually see how we attached it here. So this is one of our radio tracked um, Mexican jumping pit vipers, and you can see the duct tape um, is got, and the bulge of the radio transmitter is just underneath it, and that silver aerial that sticks out, um, it runs parallel to the tail when the tail's out straight. Um, and the project design, so the idea behind it was that by radio tracking these snakes, we'd be able to map out the home range of these species, looking at the habitat usage, and also looking at the habitat preference, so we'd know where they go, but where they prefer to spend most of their time. The idea was that we'd also be able to gain some natural history information about things like diet, movement patterns, and build a bit of an activity profile. And that we would also be able to build a temperature profile too to look at their thermal ecology. Um, and I was doing that by taking the temperatures of the snakes and their surroundings whenever I would find them whilst I was out radio tracking. And uh, well, so what happened? Um, now, this is a lot less data heavy, this section, than the last results section. Um, because in some cases, the snakes they didn't actually move. Um, some of them didn't move. Uh, I had two snakes that for um, about eight weeks didn't move at all. And that makes it very hard to analyze that data. But 
that's what they did. Um, so that's all I could report. Um, or they moved too much. Some snakes actually went so far that I, I lost signal completely and I couldn't find them again. Um, and those transmitters are, are lost now. They will shed them off. Um, or they shed off the transmitter. I had one snake that the night I released it, um, with the transmitter on, um, it shed its skin, and I found the transmitter the next morning in the leaf litter. Um, but these were some of the limitations, but I did actually also get some really useful naturalist information about the species as well. Um, and most notably about the uh, Botrychus March IV emerald palm pit viper, what we now know is that over 80% of the time they're spending, um, they're spending up in the canopy which is something that we didn't know before because the only time we would ever detect them is when they were at eye level or, or uh, lower than the canopy because you can't actually see them. Um, now that we know that, we also know that this very complex um, arboreal structure that's high in the canopy is clearly very important for this species. And if that disappears because of deforestation, it's likely that the species will have some very negative impact. Also got some diet information um, by observing them um, uh, eating, uh, on some amphibians. And because of uh, the limitations that we had, we've also been able to make some recommendations for future studies of this species too. Now, uh, sticking with the theme of this, uh, this speaker series, um, ex situ conservation, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on in Kasuko and what I'm doing while I'm here in the UK. So in Kasuko now, um, as you heard from John Colby in his ex situ um, talk, uh, there is HARC, which is the Honduras Amphibian Re Rescue Conservation Center, which is very close to being ready to um, take you know, amphibians from Kasuko um, and as part of a captive breeding conservation project. Um, that is one of the most exciting projects that's coming that's going on in Kasuko at the minute. Um, the patrols are uh, a community-led project. Um, are uh, community rangers going out into Kasuko and then monitoring things like deforestation and poaching that's occurring. And the ICF is the Honduran government. They are increasing the amount of funding, the increasing the amount of patrols that are going out into the forest and also into the wider mountain region as well. Um, so all of that um, is, is very, very positive conservation that's going on in Kasuko. And um, from my side, whilst uh, certainly while I'm in lockdown, um, I'm doing a lot more science communication through social media. I'm also doing lots of um, talks and guest lectures uh, similar to, to this kind of thing. Um, and my side come also um, is with talks with um, organizations like Anturus um, and Celebrity Cruises. Um, they tend to be about um, my research. They tend to be about snakes in general, which are um, a taxa that worldwide needs a lot of conservation. Um, and also about other conservation topics, um, wildlife in general too. Um, so that is, that's me. Um, and now if you have any questions um, about this talk, about any of my other talks that I might have, you might have seen, um, or any other parts of, uh, about my research, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, or, and uh, even if it's for the um, Q&A session that we'll be doing with Operation Wallacea, um, get in touch with them, send through your questions, and I will really, uh, I really look forward to reading them. Thank you very much.